Alrighty, I think we're going to get started this evening, but thank you again everybody for joining in. I'm Nancy Howell, again on board of Western Cuyahoga Audubon, and your host for this evening. I hope you had a chance to take a look at those questions on the bird quiz, and I'll bet you did a really great job of answering all of them. You'll, you'll like number five. Five is the best. I like that one. Alrighty. So, and Betsy will be working with our, our slides, and we'll ask her to go to the next slide, please. We'll go over the answers of these shortly. Alrighty, so today is Tuesday, April 6th. Can't believe it already. And um, we're going to have a great presentation this evening. So how about the next slide, Betsy, please? And that's me, board member and membership chair and treasurer and wearing many, many hats. And next, please. All righty. So welcome to everybody. Um, I'm not going to have Betsy jump to the next uh, slide yet, but maybe I can get a few folks to unmute or maybe type something in the chat. For the first question on that bird quiz, can you list or identify five things that birds' feathers are useful? Birds use their feathers for. How useful are bird feathers? Anybody want to give uh, an answer? Again, either in the chat or unmute and shout it out. Oh, come on. Oh, all right, somebody broke perhaps their nest. Temperature regulation, mm, I like that one. Protection from precipitation, all right. Anything else? Flight. Oh, balance, woodpecker tails, oh, okay. Enable flight. Oh, this is this is good. I think you're you're doing really well. Let's go on to those quiz answers to the next uh, slide, please, Betsy, and see what we were able to do. All righty. So five ways that feathers help birds: protection from the elements. That was one thing. Rain, snow, sun, exact, uh, etc. Uh, coloration gives you know. That's what they're what's on the outside. Is their coloration camouflage? Could be for distraction. Um, there's a, a wide array of coloration of birds, as you know. Uh, for flight, obviously. Um, display, mate attraction, um, territory, maintenance, uh, you know, that type of thing. Temperature control, I think somebody mentioned that. Warmth, insulation, cooling. Um, uh, I think one person said, hey, maybe their nest. And do birds sometimes do use feathers in their nest, at least to line the nest. Um, uh, for for again uh, for insulation so they're very good all right yay I'm pr proud of everybody uh, the second question was um, that uh, many types of dinosaurs had feathers as covering true or false let's go on to the next slide and see if that is true or false it is true and as a matter of fact, this was fairly recent. Uh, this is a piece of amber from Myanmar that had a piece of a dinosaur tail stuck in it. And clearly those are little, again, feathers. Um, this is magnified highly because they were very small. But a lot of different dinosaurs did have sport feathers uh, and some for insulation. Um, more and more information seems to be indicating that, that dinosaurs also had feathers for display purposes, uh, uh, maybe even for helping to catch prey, long feathers on the arms to, to maybe help, again, wrap around prey. So, so that's pretty cool. So when you're out bird watching, you really are out dinosaur watching. Right. Let's back up to the previous slide, please, Betsy. Oh, and how are feathers part of the story about the foundation of the National Audubon Society? Well, maybe many of you know that um, millions of birds were slaughtered 
of uh, primarily water birds, but really a wide variety of birds were, were killed, particularly egrets and other waders for the millinery, the hat trade, uh, which, you know, they used feathers, they used uh, stuffed birds on the hats. Um, and one of the fun, funny things is there's a, a story, and Harry, Harriet Hemingway and Minna Hall, two people part of the Massachusetts Audubon Society, they actually had people walking in the downtown, I'm not sure if it was Boston or New York, and indicating what species of birds were on people's hats. And they had a whole checklist of birds that, that were on hats. Uh, so Betsy, let's go to the slide showing, um, it's right after the, that dinosaur, t there you go. So this is what ladies uh, decorated their hats. You see feathers, and I think you even see a, a mounted bird on the hat. And um, uh, again, egrets primarily were the target for those really fine uh, feathers that are along the back and the breast of the bird called aigrettes. And they would pay uh, for, uh, for those feathers by the pound. And if you know anything about feathers, feathers are very lightweight. Just think about how much a pound of, of or how many feathers are in a pound of those very, very filamentous uh, feathers. So lots and lots of birds were killed. Uh, egrets developed those during the breeding season and nesting season. So you, once those birds were, were killed, of course, nests were abandoned, eggs were abandoned, and chicks were abandoned. So really, it, it hit that, the, that group of birds incredibly, incredibly hard. All right, let's back up to our, our quiz answers again, please. And feathers are made up of the same material as our fingernails and hair, which is called keratin. All right, see those fingernails? Cool. All right, and which side of a bird has the most feathers? The outside of a bird. Ah. I, I don't hear you laughing. I don't see anybody smiling. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, this is a kid's joke. And if you want to use it at some point for one of your kids or grandkids or whatever, or one of the neighbor's kids, just give it a try. So, yeah, so the outside of a bird has the feathers on it. Cool. All right. Thanks, Betsy. Appreciate your, your moving through those slides nicely. So let's see where we're headed next. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, we've been having woodcock watches on Wednesday evenings. Uh, tomorrow is our second. The first one occurred on uh, Wednesday, March 31st. Uh, we had uh, several people. You can see how people are seated at least six feet apart with masks. So we're doing all the correct COVID protocols. And uh, we're viewing the lovely scene that you see on the right. Yes, it is under a set of uh, power poles, but the habitat that the woodcock are using for their evening displays uh, is perfect uh, under that um, under those power poles. In that, the there's you know brush, there's short grasses. Um, again, the woodcock like to display in in a, a habitat that you see under those power poles. Again, some grasses, some brush. Um, uh, tall weeds, but not forest stuff. So we're going to have our second woodcock watch tomorrow. Uh, it is filled. I think most of them are filled. You may want to check our uh, website. I don't know if we have any other openings. We may have two openings, one of the Wednesday evenings. Um, but these are going to go on through the end of April. Next slide, please. All right. Um, Western Cuyahoga Audubon is a member of the Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters. And this past Saturday, the 3rd, we, there was a very, very successful spring gathering. It was done virtually. And what was really exciting about it is that uh, again, there was a lot of uh, discussion uh, talking about the collaboration between different chapters and other institutions. So, so it was really interesting to hear what other chapters are doing um, and how they're partnering with other organizations and other institutions. What I happened to like 
was a breakout session. There were uh, at least, I think, four or five breakout rooms. And um, again, we had discussions on concerns uh, of de on developing chapter leadership. So people were coming up with some great ideas as to how to get more people on the board, how to get more volunteers into leadership roles. So and again, this seems to be a, an occurring uh, theme with a lot of, of uh, chapters. So it was really very helpful in, in, um, in attending that. Now, one other thing that uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon would like to be included in is um, uh, help fund bird banding research at a banding station in Nicaragua. And this is through the Institute for Bird Populations, IBP, and their uh, uh, thing called Monitoring, Over, Monitoring Overwinter Survival, or MOSI. Um, six or seven chapters would be donating funds for uh, support of the uh, banding research in uh, down in, in Central America in Nicaragua, and um, with all this pool, all these pooled funds, uh, the IBP would send money to either one station or maybe divide it up between several of the stations. There's at least four stations that that really really are depending on funds. They do not have the funding like banding. Uh, stations here up in North America and Canada and the U.S. Um, but the important thing is not only are they uh, banding the, the birds that are there regularly, the ones that are, are residents in the tropics, but remember this is this is a, a wintering time banding. When, when the birds are not here, these neotropical migrants are not here in Ohio or in North America, they're down in Central and South America. Things like indigo bunting, wood thrush, several of the warbler, warblers, black and white, chestnut-sided warbler. So uh, it's important to find out where these birds, what their habitat they need down in, in their, their wintering area, which is really where they spend most of the time. Oh, by the way, one of the banding stations is a, a, um, a shade-grown coffee plantation. So it's a bird-friendly coffee plantation. So that would be an interesting one to see what species, because Western Cuyahoga uh, does sell shade-grown, bird-friendly coffee. Uh, so that, it's really interesting. So like I say, the potential there is really to spread funds either through uh, uh, several of the stations, of the banding stations, or maybe pool it all to one. That would be up for the IBP, the Institute for Bird Populations, uh, to decide. So. Um, uh, you may go on the website for IBP and find out a little bit about that uh, MOSI uh, information and just see what IBP is doing. They're, they're doing quite a bit of, of research and they're very, very knowledgeable. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, next slide, please. Mm, pretty. We, have a, we like pretty slides. <laughs> for Sanitary Warbler. Oh, Spring Warbler Challenge. Woohoo! All right, so we did, had a successful fall warbler challenge where participants could go throughout the county in which they live. All right, so that's one of the bullet points. Um, so first of all, you want to register for the spring warbler challenge. The challenge occurs anywhere be three, between uh, April 1st, started already, through the end of May. And we will use the honor system for your sightings. And hopefully you will remain in the county in which you live. So if you live in Cuyahoga County, you can bird anywhere in Cuyahoga County to tally up your warblers. Right? If you live in Summit County, anywhere in Summit or Lorraine County or wherever you are living. Uh, but again, uh, in, in the county in which you live. Uh, you can bird on your own or with a small group. Uh, if you do bird with others, please follow the COVID uh, guidelines, wearing masks, remaining at least six feet apart, which is really tough when you're out birding and you want to see something or point something out to someone, uh, and wash hands frequently or use hand sanitizer. Um, there is a chart in which you can keep track of your warblers. First of all, there's a place to keep track of where you're birding, uh, what day, and the, and the location. For example, if you're going out on Friday and you're going to be at Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve and you see 
yellow rump warblers, boom, that's the, that's the uh, part that you will check off. Next week, maybe the war more warblers will be coming in, go to a different place, and again, simply fill in the date, the location, and check off the warblers that you saw. And then when you finish, when we're done by the end of May, uh, please send those entries in because we have prizes. So uh, one of the prize, uh, one of the parts of the prizes is a membership uh, for Western Cuyahoga, which is a $40 value. Uh, if you're a member already, we simply roll it into next member year. If you're not a member, boom, you become a new member. Um, we have urban birding t-shirts. And, you know, should there be a tie, you know, when, when all these uh, entries come in, uh, they will be, one will be selected at random. Next, please. All right. Uh, our board member, Michelle Brocious, is, is on next. Hi, Michelle. How are you? I'm good, Nancy. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Brocious. I'm a board member of the Western Chicago Audubon Society and field trip co-coordinator. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. Hang on. No problem. Just a second. Thank you. All right. So uh, this evening, I'm going to be giving you the second Saturday bird walk report. I'm going to talk a little bit about the virtual field trip opportunities that we have, uh, a little bit about the social distancing birding guidelines, and then how you can connect with us between our programs. Next slide, please. I think I'll get more rice. I will. All right, so in-person activities, well, not all of them, but we have the Woodcock Watch now, uh, but most of our bird walks uh, do continue to be canceled to reduce the spread of COVID-19. However, Bill Dininger and Dave Grass Kemper are still going out for the canceled second Saturday bird walks to collect bird survey data for eBird. The March 2nd Saturday bird walk was a beautiful sunny morning and 34 species were tallied. The morning started off with a gorgeous pair of red-shouldered hawks soaring directly above low enough to have a great view of all their distinct feathers. This was followed shortly after by a soaring immature bald eagle again directly above. It was a good day for raptors with Cooper's mm -hmm. hawks, red-tailed hawks, and turkey vultures added to the list. Not many migrants were spotted, but you know it's March, so it's early. Uh, the red-winged blackbirds and cowbirds were in several locations. There were good looks at the eastern bluebird. However, the highlight of the day were a pair of barred owls, and you can see I um, I was there and I did take a picture of the pair of owls which you can see on the screen. All right, next slide, please. Okay, uh, last month our virtual field trip was at North Chagrin Reservation in search of the red winged blackbird. At least six participants visited the park throughout the month. I am currently compiling the bird list, journaling, and photos submitted to me into a digital scrapbook. So if you haven't sent me your items, Please get those over to me by end of day, Friday, April 9th. That's this Friday. I will then present the scrapbook at our virtual meetup next Wednesday, April 14th at 7 p.m. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit the park last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. Next slide, please. Oh, fantastic. All right, April's virtual field trip takes place at Lucia S. Nash Preserve in Burton, Ohio, where we will be looking for the Sandhill Crane and Yellow-Bellied Sapsucker. Owned by the Ohio Nature Conservancy, this preserve opened in summer of 2020, and no historical eBird data exists for the month of April. So I'm challenging us all to, to go and visit and to change that. According to their website, you can walk the Barbara A. Lipscomb's Snow Lake Trail in search of our target species and much more. Uh, during your visit to the park, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. You can take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen. Tally identified species, journal your thoughts, or create a poem or a haiku. Uh, send your items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, wcaudubon.org, and clicking the Virtual Field Trips 2021 tile on the home page. Next slide, please. All right, I know we are all itching to put the pandemic behind us, and this looks promising as more and more folks are getting vaccinated. However, please continue to keep yourself and others safe. 
As you get out there to bird and enjoy nature during the pandemic, we encourage you to take precautions by limiting your group size to 10 people or less, staying six feet apart from others not in your household, traveling separately, wearing a face mask and washing your hands or using a high alcohol hand sanitizer. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, uh, please stay connected with us in between these virtual meetups by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I am one of the Instagram admins and have launched a fun activity for featuring a bird photo of the day. Simply use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded like this speaker series meeting and our virtual field trips that I mentioned and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel. So please be sure to subscribe. Next slide, please. Okay, that's it. Uh, I guess we're on the Betsy. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Michelle. And yes, uh, if you can join in on those virtual field trip meetups, they are a lot of fun. Even if you didn't go on the field trip, it just gives you a real highlight as to what people saw. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun saying, oh yeah, I saw that, or oh, you saw that. So it, it's great. So uh, Betsy O'Hagan will uh, report next, please. Hi, Betsy. Hi. So I'm going to talk briefly about Red Start on the Road a couple, and Guardians of Nature, our book club and wildlife program, our photography winner and contest, and just a quick reminder about the end of month coffee free shipping code. Uh, this is Red Start on the Road, which is coming this weekend. I hope that you will join us. Um, it is in collaboration with uh, Red Start Birding and Bird Watchers Digest, and um, it features the opportunity for anyone who uh, makes a reservation or schedules an appointment to come and uh, meet the Red Start Birding folks and test out equipment, uh, and then uh, you can order it online and have it de delivered directly to you. Uh, Anyone who comes this weekend will get receive a 5% discount on all purchases, and Red Start uh, Birding has dedicated it uh, the entire weekend, both days, as a fundraiser for WCAS uh, educational activities, which means that 5% um, of each day sales are, uh, are donated to WCAS. So please do come by. This is a really wonderful opportunity for everyone uh, to shop and to also register for uh, some simultaneous uh, bird walks that are happening on Saturday at Wendy Park and on Sunday at the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. So um, do go to the homepage of the website and look for the navigational button there and it'll take you to the information. Uh, our next uh, announcement is uh, this month's Guardians of Nature meeting. These are uh, held on the last two Thursdays of every month, and they're basically a chance and a time for people, volunteers, uh, to come together and to work to uh, share updates about projects that they're working on uh, that are uh, for and with WCAS. And, uh, and the fun thing is this month on the second meetup, which is the 29th, as you see it listed on your slide, um, Daniel Brown, who is co-founder of Rust Belt Riders, an awesome uh, environmental, environmentally conscious social entrepreneur uh, who is now starting several businesses dedicated to repurposing waste and uh, food products as he, uh, their tagline is, I believe, which I love, is feed people, not landfills. So please do come. Uh, register if you would so we can give you a warm welcome. These are no charge, and uh, we meet here at the uh, uh, virtual conference center um, to work on projects, as I mentioned, and then also to learn and hear and get see if we can soak up some of that excitement and innovation mindset that Daniel will share with us. 
Again, go to the home page and look for the navigational button there and you'll see more information. The next uh, program that I'd like to remind you about is Katie Fallon, who will be joining us for the Speaker Book Club. And she is going to be talking about her beautiful books, Ruling in Blues, A Personal Search for a Vanishing Songbird. Uh, and these, again, are on two Sundays in the month, the last two Sundays of the month. And the first one uh, will have the speaker. That will be Katie. And then the second session on the 25th is a discussion uh, where everyone's invited, including authors if they're available, to come and talk about their most favorite nature book. Um, by the way, I also do want to uh, tell you that if you purchase, uh, decide to purchase this beautiful book, um, and whether or not, but we hope you will attend our book club, um, the publisher has kindly created a discount code for us. Uh, and you can buy the book for 20% off. Just use the, use the code that's listed on the slide. And this again, uh, the book club, you can go to the home page of the website, look for the navigational button, and get more details and register there. Uh, Katie will also be leading uh, a live broadcast from uh, the uh, Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, where she is a founder. And we're going to be learning more about the bird, uh, the birds and the wildlife, the residents and the patients who are there. Um, this is part of a, a, a of a larger veterinarian campus, and it is located near Morgantown, West Virginia. I know you'll love it. Uh, Katie's awesome, and the animals are awesome too, live on camera. And uh, this again is a no charge, I believe. Um, so again. Please go to the home page and look for the navigational button. We're going to have fun, and I hope you'll enjoy. You'll join us. Our next um, piece that I'd like to talk to you about is um, we do have a monthly photography contest, and for the month of March, the um, uh, the vulture, turkey vulture, was the bird of the month, and uh, this is the winning. Uh, the judges decided this is the winning photograph. Uh, the Variant, Valiant Vulture by Elisa Gerbic. And as she describes, uh, we saw this turkey vulture on West Ridgewood on our way to the Watership, uh, Watershed uh, Stewardship Center in Perma, Ohio. Uh, there were actually two vultures there eating some sort of prey on the far side. So th congratulations, Elisa. And um, this is, uh, thank you for entering. Uh, the April photo contest, the featured bird is the um, pileated or pileated woodpecker. Uh, it runs for the entire month. There is a small uh, charge to enter for each photo, uh, and uh, you uh, winners do become eligible for the yearly contest and additional prizes. The prizes are, are really nice uh, for this. You can um, uh, receive, have the choice of several prizes. One is a one-year uh, subscription to Birdwatcher's Digest, uh, which is a leading publication uh, for birding, and, uh, and or we have a copy of David Lindo, the Urban Birder's book, How to Be an Urban Birder, and several other prizes that I know you'll enjoy. So um, please send us your best uh, pileated woodpecker photo. And finally, I want to remind you about um, at the end of the month, every month at the end of the month, uh, we um, offer a seven-day uh, free shipping code um, to anyone who orders bird-friendly coffee. And uh, you will order it directly at Birds and Beans Coffee, as I've listed at the bottom of the slide. It, use the discount code there and you will receive uh, free shipping. Uh, and it's really great. I've listed the seven benefits of joining WCAS Bird Friendly Coffee Club real quick. Wholesale prices, low to no shipping. Uh, uh, it supports WCAS financially. 5% uh, of the annual sales are rebated back to the chapter to support conservation activities. 
Um, we are one of, uh, right now, one of the few places that offer the copy, but during COVID, you will order it through uh, the, through the uh, distributor, um, Birds and Beans, outside of Boston. It's fresh roasted, roasted no more than three days uh, before they ship. It tastes great. And the good thing is, is that you are supporting the families that work the shade-grown coffee farms in Central and South America where our migratory birds uh, winter. So please do look into that. And again, please go to our homepage on the website and look for the navigational button. You can get to anywhere on the website from there. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Betsy. Lots and lots of information. Uh, Kurt, Kurt Miske, another board member. Hi, Kurt. How are you doing this evening? Remember to unmute, please. There, it finally allowed me to unmute. All right. And I, and I can't see myself, so uh, hopefully everybody else can't either. Uh, next slide, please. So as most of you probably know by now, uh, WCAS, with funding from the Gene E. Miskey Memorial Fund and donations to the project by all of you, have allowed us to uh, install, purchase and install, five bluebird houses uh, at Lewis Road Riding Ring, and I believe directions are on the web. Next slide, please. So we have been monitoring since we put these up in late March. There are five of us doing the monitoring. Uh, so far, nothing, but bluebirds don't typically start nesting until early to mid-April, so we're not disappointed yet. Uh, and we're going to continue monitoring at a rate of twice per week. As I mentioned, there are five of us. A nice number would be six. So if anyone is interested in becoming a monitor for this project, it takes about 20 minutes to walk the trail, uh, and it's pretty easy. So uh, again, I'm on the website. Please give me a call or give me an email. And of course, you can donate. Still, we're still accepting donations, and we're still matching one for one. So, yes, we are. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, so, so no bluebirds yet, but yeah, I saw something on the one slide said windy. So, what the monitoring was on those days was was a little too windy, or what? What was well, going we, on? We believe that the fact that it's really windy there the last couple of weeks is stopping them from doing anything. We have seen bluebirds on site. They just aren't nesting. Okay. So. They'll be there. Cool. All right. Karu. Hi, Karu. How are you doing this evening? Uh, we have a nice uh, bird-friendly native plant sale. So, Karu. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Can, I can hear you. Uh, so we are uh, without a camera and good evening everyone. So I'm called to run a bird friendly native plant sale committee, a board member. So as you may know, April the national native plant month. So why don't you consider to have uh, native plants in your garden? Uh, so what we are doing is Choose five different meters for each month. So, and can you go to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. So, we choose wild flower vine, early beer tongue, fire pink, common blue eyed grass, golden alexanders in April. Now, please look at our website. Uh, Store and uh, uh, this is only online, so we will uh, pick up the plants for you and uh, drop them off to your house. 
and we are also still looking for volunteers. Uh, uh, these involved in the helpful, like just choosing the plant or uh, dropping, like driving, driving for us or something like that. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Karu. I know it was a little hard for me to hear everything. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if, if I heard everything correctly, but uh, yes, we will. Uh, once the plants are ordered, we will drop them off at your home. Uh, so uh, please purchase some native plants, the columbine, the fire pink, and uh, different plants are available each month. So you might want to look at the website and see what's available for April. May and I believe June. Next slide, please. Uh, Michelle, once again. Okay, this is a surprise. I didn't know I was going again. Let's see. Next slide, please. <laughs> Okay, I guess I'm doing this one. <laughs> All right, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, we are still running our Mitchell's Homemade Ice Cream uh, fundraiser. So we do have gift cards for sale in $10 denominations. It has been nice and warm. And I know my family, uh, we had ice cream just the other day for Mitchell's. So uh, please, if you love ice cream as much as my family does, go ahead and uh, go to our store. Uh, purchase these wonderful gift cards and and use them as you know the nice weather approaches and they also make really great gifts so if you have birthdays coming up or you know any other occasion uh, go ahead and uh, I encourage you to consider this idea all right next slide okay and we're also we're continuing to uh, accept chapter memberships uh, throughout the year so please go to our store and uh, we have uh, different membership levels available. Next slide, please. All right. Um, and thanks so much, Michelle. Uh, by the way, the uh, Mitchell's gift cards, uh, we will send them to you. Uh, or if you're close enough, we know your address, we can drop them off, we can contact you. So um, yeah, uh, it's getting warm. It's ice cream season and birthdays and stuff like that. All right, um, don't forget next month on Tuesday, May 4th, we will have our regular program on the first Tuesday of the month. Uh, this time Blake Matthews will talk about the Central Ohio Owl Project. But don't worry about that word Central Ohio because Blake is looking for uh, information about owls throughout the state of Ohio. So concentrate on the Central Ohio, Pro Ohio Owl Project, but uh, also, again, this is this is really going to cover all of Ohio. So just trying to find out where owls are nesting, or roosting, or, uh, that type of thing. Uh, so since they're nocturnal, it's a little harder to study them. So getting the information to Blake um, will be really, really important. But this evening, next slide please, I'd like to introduce Carrie Elvey, who is the Senior Naturalist uh, and Community Engagement Coordinator at the Wilderness Center in Stark County. Uh, I had the pleasure of listening to Carrie do a presentation during a uh, Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters uh, gathering. And I was like, wow, I mean, she is the naturalist naturalist. She's knowledgeable, uh, friendly. Um, just really, really engaging, and and uh, I don't want to take up too much more time. And I think we'll really, really enjoy the cute chicks this evening. Uh, well, wrong kind of chicks, I think you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so, Carrie, please, we're so happy that you were able to join us this evening, and uh, I hope I, I I introduced you well enough. That's great. I so appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for having me. I always really enjoy doing uh, the programs for Audubon Societies. I get to hear what everybody's what everybody's up to. Uh, and man, you guys are doing so many cool things. I'm I'm really I'm really excited about everything that you're doing. I will just give everybody one quick um, sort of announcement. Uh, many of you know and have participated in Shreve Migration Sensation. 
Um, we are not doing that this year. Obviously, as the year the time has passed, we also missed it last year. Um, but the Wilderness Center is is taking over the organization of that event, um, and so we will be coming back to it next year and hope to be working with a lot of um, a lot of you, a lot of the Audubon societies, to really make that event um, a bigger statewide wide event. So you can um, kind of mark that in your calendars for next March. Um, can you see my slides? Okay, does everything look all right? Okay. So this program is actually part of a series that we do um, called the Nature Study Series. I do it every year. Uh, this year happened to be, we just finished last week, um, was the Lives of Birds. So this uh, program came out of that series. Um, we called it uh, Cute Chicks Tonight for Fun, um, but it's uh, really all about nesting um, strategies and how nestlings survive and um, the different ways that we care for nesting. And so as we enter into nesting season, um, this is a, a good timely program. I was also really excited, all of the quiz questions, we covered every one of those quiz questions in the nature study series. So that was such a nice uh, such kind of wrap up for me from, from that series. And it was nice to see that everybody did so well. Um, so we're gonna start off tonight with just a couple of terms, um, just so we're, we're all using the, right, the same terms. Um, synchronous and asynchronous hatching, Synchronous is what most of us think of when we think of, um, well, we think of baby birds, the baby birds in a nest, they all hatch at the same time, they all develop at the same time and fledge at the same time. But we also have some birds that do asynchronous hatching, uh, like these uh, barn owl chicks that are here on the right. And so there's two different theories for why asynchronous hatching actually happens. Um, the original theory was that uh, by, by laying and incubating it as soon as you start, um, birds that are feeding a food source that is widely variable. So barn owls are feeding mostly rodents. Rodent populations boom and bust really quickly. That if you have asynchronous hatching, um, you can see here's the, the big bird on the right is the oldest, the baby in the middle, and then the middle child on the left. Um, don't tell my siblings <laughs> this or your siblings this, but the way that works is that they think that if the food source would boom, at least one of those chicks would be far enough ahead that they could probably make it. And so the young ones may not get fed and kind of get pushed aside. That was one theory. The, the um, kind of a more modern theory is looking at the idea that uh, many birds put more energy, more weight into their later eggs so it's a way to actually even out the playing field. The first egg hatches first, but the last egg to hatch has a little bit further ahead, a further boost. Um, so I actually do like to share with my siblings the idea that, you know, if they don't behave, they may not get the food. <laughs> um, but that's up to you, how you want to do it. Uh, synchronous and asynchronous hatching, they're two very different, um, different models. And then we have precocial and altricial chicks. Again, most of us, when we think of chicks, we think of the altricials, uh, like the ones on the right, totally helpless, eyes closed, no feathers, um, versus the ones that hit the ground um, ready to go. So when we take a look at the differences, altricial chicks, eyes closed, no down feathers, basically immobile, totally dependent on the parents. The egg sizes tend to be small, um, only 4 to 10 percent of the parents' weight. Um, and they have really, really poor muscle control, and they can't um, work their heat muscles um, really well. Uh, and before I jump into precocial, I will say, if you have questions as we go along, feel free to drop those into the chat. I am kind of watching the chat. Um, Betsy has offered to help watch the chat, too, um, if I miss something. So feel free to leave questions as, as we go. Um, so precocial chicks, these are the really, really cute ones. Their eyes are open. They're downy and soft. They're able to walk and swim. Um, varying levels of dependence. Some hit the ground ready to go. Some uh, need some help being shown food or helping find food. Their large size is up to 25% of the mother's weight in each egg. That's a really, really heavy egg. So they're preloading a lot of that development into the egg. Obviously really sophisticated muscle control and they're able to stay warm largely on their own with those, um, with those downy chicks. 
And because this program's called Cute Chicks, here's a cute chick. Uh, Sandra Crane, so this is uh, what you guys will be looking for um, at your virtual field trips. Uh, incredible birds, amazing to have them back in Ohio. And they are very much a precocial, uh, a precocial bird. Um, like all things in nature, those terms precocial and altricial, it's a gradient. Um, so there are some birds that are totally altricial. Then there's these really, really cool birds that are super precocial. That sounds like a Mary Poppins term. Um, but super precocial birds, they're um, these sort of turkey-like birds found in uh, New Zealand. And they actually build their nests and lay their eggs in basically a big compost heap. And the heat from the compost heap hatches. Uh, warms the eggs enough they hatch. So when these babies come out of this compost heap, the parents are gone. They're totally feathered, totally on their own. Um, and which is a really, really interesting, um, a really interesting phenomenon. So no parental help at all in those super precocial birds. But the other interesting thing is that ground nesting birds have a lot more threats than birds that are hidden away in a really, really complex uh, nest that's off the ground. So there's also this gradient from ground nesting birds need to be more precocial compared to cavity nesting birds or um, swifts or weaver birds that are really totally protected in these tiny nests. So once you get a nest, once you get these babies hatched, there's a lot of work that goes into feeding baby birds. And there's a lot of different strategies for feeding baby birds as well. And so this is what we're going to look at is these different strategies for feeding baby birds. This is the most common. The parent collects some food, carries it in its, in its mouth, and shoves that food down the baby's gullet. Um, mostly this is altricial birds that are doing this. And they've done all sorts of really cool studies. Um, different people have counted the number of insects that it takes. Uh, this is from a Phoebe nest. Uh, in 17 days, this Phoebe they watched this Phoebe bring in, make 8,942 visits to the nest. So going out, getting food, bringing it back. Um, and if you do the math, that's about 131 meals per every young over that 17 days. That's a lot of work. And that's why so many of our songbirds um, that have these really altricial young are also monogamous. So they're, the, it's two birds sharing the work. Because being a single mom to a brood like that is a whole different thing um, than being a single duck mom. This is just another example, tree swallows. Tree swallows do it a little bit differently. They have those huge gaping mouths and they collect many items at one time. Um, so on average, it's about 19 critters that they have in their mouth. And they can actually pack all that into their mouth um, and in this study, looking at these tree swallows, uh, there were five young, about 8,000 items fed per day. 8,000 insects fed per day. So any of you who are following Doug Tallamy or who are really looking to make a difference in your own backyard, you've got to put bird food out and not bird food that comes in a bag, bird feed that comes from planting native plants. Um, because they need all of these critters, um, and, and it takes a lot to feed those birds. And so when we look at these bird beaks, um, we, we see a different color than the female birds or the parent birds would see. They see more infrared color. Um, but one of the cutest things about cute chicks is that big gaping mouth, um, and these, this gape around their mouth is a very specific color. And so we think that the color actually tells the parents how healthy the birds are. So they did this really neat study with barn swallows, and they um, took Kool-Aid, and they dyed the beaks, that gape, of some of the birds with Kool-Aid to make them redder and some of them not so red. And the birds that had the brighter gape got more food. The parents shoved more food down their beaks. So that led to the question, well, why, why is that? What does that redness signify? So they did some other experiments where they um, gave the chicks actually some um, sheep, uh, sheep blood cells. So it activated their immune systems. And so the birds that were struggling 
having to up their immune system to fight off these sheep blood cells, the color of their gait became duller. And so gait color, we think, is a way that birds can tell which one of their babies is healthy and which one's not. And if it's taking thousands of bird, uh, insects to feed a baby bird and one's not healthy, that's, that's when birds get kicked out of the nest. And so this, um, this idea of feeding, uh, feeding this gate, shoving food into that gate is so ingrained. Um, this is a cardinal that's lost its head. So male cardinal that's lost its head because of parasites. Uh, and these goldfish at this pond, and he spent the entire summer trying to shove food down the gates of these, of these goldfish. I mean, because it mimics what a, a baby bird would be. <laughs> so that really, really ingrained behavior is, is lots of fun to watch. Um, other birds actually swallow the food, carry it around, and then regurgitate it back into the baby bird's mouth, like in hummingbirds. If you've ever seen hummingbirds uh, feed their babies, it's amazing. If you get a chance, Google that um, some evening. It looks like they're going to stab that long, skinny beak right <laughs> through those babies. It's so fast, um, but they're regurgitating that food uh, into the babies. This is really, um, really efficient. It's efficient because it's a lot easier to carry juice in your stomach than a whole beak full of, of insects. So some don't actually regurgitate into the mouth. Some regurgitate into the nest nearby. So I hope everybody's far enough um, past dinner and not into evening snack time. Um, these are galls, and gall feeding is fascinating because galls um, that are in breeding season have that red dot on their bill. And that red dot is like putting a coin slot in a gumball machine. When you hit that red dot, they upchuck. And so baby gulls know this. It's ingrained to peck at a red dot. Um, the ornithologist Tinbergen, who did a lot of, of um, the stimulus response kind of research, tested these baby birds with wooden uh, cutouts, painted like a gull head with a red dot and without. And baby chicks that had never met a parent were still pecking at that red dot. So one of my um, sort of life goals is to get up close enough to a gall to tap that myself and see what happens, see if, if I can induce that response too, because that seems like a worthy fr fun Friday night kind of activity. Other birds actually uh, open their mouth and let the young retrieve the food. And these are mostly, pictures are in here mostly just because there's nothing quite as cute and weird as a baby pelican. <laughs> So other birds actually produce milk. It's not milk, mammal milk. It's a, it's a fluid, a nutrient-rich fluid that gets produced in the crop. So they're actually making the food. They're not regurgitating food that they've eaten. They're actually producing this milk in their crop, and it gets regurgitated. Um, and things like morning doves and pigeons do this. Um, and so these two uh, pit morning doves babies are actually drinking that milk. This is a really great strategy because if you've ever seen a morning dove nest, it's basically three sticks stuck together um, hoping that it will hold eggs. So it's not a deep nest. There's no protection. There are these crazy nests that should never stay together in the first place. And so because the birds don't have to leave the nest very often, they're not constantly out collecting food, they have a much safer time protecting their babies, keeping them warm, and keeping them falling off of one of these three stick nests. And then some birds uh, are carrying food in their talons, like eagles. Um, sometimes they're bringing whole food and ripping pieces off and feeding their babies. Later they'll rip off chunks and let the babies eat. Uh, and then later they'll just dump a whole fish uh, or whatever, uh, and the babies themselves will rip it apart. So this uh, next slide, some of you might recognize um, this artwork. This is from one of the Golden Guide books that I certainly grew up with. I suspect many of you did. Um, there's a Golden Guide book called Birding Behavior. It's one of the best intro quick guides to birding behavior. We use it all the time. Um, but this, is, this, is a, this artwork is from that book. Uh, and it's based on the work of Margaret Morse Nice 
who studied song sparrows. She was in Ohio. Uh, she lived in Ohio. She was this amazing uh, woman who followed her husband. She was, they were both teachers. Um, she followed her husband to Ohio when he came to teach at Ohio State, um, but she didn't get a teaching job here. She stayed home um, to raise the family, and while she was doing all of that, she was also um, studying and publishing all this work about song sparrows. They lived right along the Olentangy River, um, so she did all this really neat work. And one of the things she found is that, found is that life is hard for baby birds. Um, so if you take 100 song sparrow eggs, about 74 of those are actually going to hatch on average and going to be nestlings. Only about 52 are actually going to fledge, meaning they're going to leave the nest, have made it all the way through. And only about 10 of them are going to make it through their first year. Um, so life is really hard. <laughs> um, by two years, there's six of them. By three years, there's three of them. By four years, um, only two of them. So there's lots and lots of things that threaten baby birds. And so what are those threats? Um, this is one of the things that Audubon Society has done such a fabulous job of really looking at and putting information together on. So we're not going to spend quite as much time on this as we uh, maybe otherwise would. Um, but predation, uh, weather, especially really cold snaps, um, early rains, uh, or really hot summers now. So those things that are affected um, by climate changes, um, and then all sorts of parasites. And so we'll take a look at some of these options and just another, another cute baby chick. So this is an interesting graphic. I hope everybody's screen is big enough to sort of see this. Um, this was a study done, they did a lot of camera studies and pulled data from all these different camera studies where cameras had been put on bird nests which is also an interesting thing. If you have your own uh, trail cams, um, it can put them on a nest. Uh, it's really interesting to see what happens. Um, but they had these nest cameras, and they looked at, in different parts of the country, what was it that was um, really destroying bird nests and predating these birds. And you can see for us in Ohio, um, yellow is other birds. Um, so for us, it was mostly birds and mammals, a tiny little bit of snakes. But if you look down south, they have a lot of insect damage in Florida and in Texas. And most of that insect damage was actually uh, fire ants, where they would come through an area and they just, they just destroy everything that's in their path. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see across different parts of the country what the different threats are to birds. Um, for us in Ohio, for mammals, these are the two big ones. Both of these, both cats and raccoons, are subsidized predators, uh, meaning we are causing part of the problem. We are supporting these predator populations. Cats, of course, because cats are allowed outside. There's feral cat populations everywhere. Um, and raccoons, because we're actually feeding raccoons either wittingly or unwittingly um, by leaving bird seed out, by leaving cat and dog food out. Um, and so both of these can absolutely devastate, um, devastate populations of young birds. The raccoon population has, is up anywhere from two to 800% in urban areas in Ohio from where it was just a couple decades ago. And one of the really interesting things, uh, if you um, followed any of the urban coyote work that's being done, a lot of it's being done out of Ohio State University. Um, they studied these coyote populations in Chicago, right around the airport. And they found these coyotes are nesting in these tiny little green spaces tucked around the city. One of the really cool things they found is that songbird populations are way up in these little tiny green spaces where the coyotes are denning. And that's because they are getting rid of, chasing away, these subsidized predators, cats and raccoons um, and other things. So the coyotes are actually helping bird populations in these areas. Um, and again, Audubon does wonderful work, especially dealing with the really tough issue of keeping cats inside um, and dealing with some of those things. And the other, the other problem is just parasites. Um, once parasites get into a nest, uh, this is a louse. Um, bird lice are actually really fascinating little critters, and they don't get enough um, good press. <laughs> um, each species of bird has a species of lice or each group of, of bird species has a species of lice. This is one of the things that they use to determine 
um, that greaves and flamingos were actually related. After they did the DNA work, they found that flamingos and greaves of all weird species are, are belong to the same group, and it's because they share a life species, among other things. So um, a lot of problems come up with um, when we talk about around here, we have these really, really cold snaps um, and these really, really heavy spring rains. That's kind of new. We didn't used to have quite the heavy spring rains that we do. Um, I'm guessing that everybody on this call has looked at uh, Audubon's climate change predictions. Um, if you haven't, you should. Um, they started doing that about a decade and a half ago. Um, their new models are fantastic. It lets you look at any bird species that you want, and it will predict um, what the range is going to be um, based on different models. Um, so definitely, definitely that is a really big threat. So as we look at these cute chicks, um, this one clearly hungry. These maybe not quite as cute, but, but certainly um, charismatic. Uh, these are this natal down that they lose really quick. Um, natal down gets replaced by that nice thermal down um, when they're about 10 days old. So these first, the first few days for these kinds of birds are really vital. This natal down is not as good at keeping them warm. Um, but they are, uh, they need to be able to thermoregulate better before they get that, that the down that we know is down. Um, so the kinds of things that you can do to help nesting birds, the biggest and most important one is provide food for them. Uh, you may not have a property that allows you to provide a lot of food for uh, bald eagles, um, but if you have a pond, certainly nesting areas for, um, for birds, um, creating, making sure that there's good vegetation um, and that you're not overrun with fish, um, mostly making sure there's caterpillars available. Uh, lots and lots of caterpillars. Caterpillars are like nature's Twinkies. Um, everybody needs them. <laughs> They're good for us and uh, absolutely vital. And the other things, of course, are protecting those nesting sites, um, making sure cats are kept indoors. Um, I am a big fan of not bird feeding. Uh, that's a whole other um, issue that I think the birding community as a whole is really struggling with. Um, when do we feed birds? How do we feed birds? How do we do it responsibly? Um, John Barber, I don't know if you've, and some of you have seen his talk that's making the way to the Audubon societies about ways to do that natively. Um, but at least pulling in bird seed during nesting season so we're not attracting things like raccoons um, into our own backyards. Um, working with organizations that are protecting nesting habitat, that's really, really vital. Uh, a lot of our bird species need deep woods. They, they can't, um, they're not successful when they're just along the forested edges. Um, so protecting habitat is also really important. Um, these are heron chicks. <laughs> and then it's also a really important, just as it's a sort of fun, um, fun trivia thing for when you're out checking nest boxes or whatever. When we look at a baby bird and we see all those bare spots of skin, those bare spots aren't going to get feathers later on. When we look at a chick with those little pin feathers, that's all the feather covering that they'll get. Most of a bird's body is actually naked of feathers, their skin, and they have these feather tracks. And so in this bird, you can see these feather tracks. That bare spot is never going to have feathers. It's just going to get floofy, and the floofiness is going to cover um, cover those bear spots. And I wanted to end with one really amazing um, cute chick note. Um, probably a lot of you follow Wisdom. She's this albatross. Um, albatrosses are uh, really in danger. They're nesting on this midway atoll, which is thousands and thousands of miles away from anything. Uh, and the chicks there are having a really hard time because there's so much plastic. So one of the main causes of death of these baby chicks is all the plastic that gets washed up and they eat it and it impacts their stomachs and they die. But this really good news is this is wisdom. Um, wisdom is the world's um, oldest known band bird, 70 years old at least. Um, she has outlived her bander. 
Uh, and we know uh, for sure um, that she's had at least 30, 30 plus chicks in her lifetime. And so she's back this year. This is her chick from this year. And so if that doesn't give you hope <laughs> for the future, I think, uh, I think nothing will. So that's kind of the quick and dirty on um, cute chicks. Again, making sure that you are um, providing as much habitat as possible and, um, and protecting the nestlings. And if you're not already participating in um, Corn Watch, that's a great program to participate in, Nest Watch rather. Uh, you can record the nests that are in your own backyard. And all of that information is really important. So it looks like we, we have a few minutes for questions, I think, Nancy. I don't see any in the comments. Yeah, I don't um, see any in the chat. Uh, maybe we can open up the mics. Uh, I don't know if the host needs to do that or if people can click and open up their own mics and and ask them questions. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Carrie. First of all, I love the photos. And secondly, it's great learning those terms, altricial, precocial, um, and uh, oh gosh, what was that? Oh, synchronous and asynchronous. I, I remember that. And uh, yeah, so so it's, it's just wonderful. And then just all the tidbits that you that you laid out. Uh, oh, I see. Thanks, Judy. It's good to see you, yeah, too. Thanks. Yeah, that's right. It's such weird thing. They do. All kinds of so they've been testing out different survival strategies, nesting strategies. And there's okay, a lot of really great research um, through Cornell Lab. Um, if, you, if you're interested in learning about where some of these things come from, um, a lot of that comes from Cornell Lab based on their nesting work. Um, but there's a, a million studies that talk about the number of birds, a number of food items that these birds need to take. Even Talamy talks about that um, in his books, the amount of, of uh, caterpillars that it takes to raise a chickadee. Uh, so that's always kind of fun to have just as trivia fun facts for, you know, Friday night dinner. <laughs> that's right. How many, how many? Uh, I'm just going to make a, a quick comment. I know I listened to a presentation a little while ago. It might have been at, at again, a COAC gathering about uh, what tree species provide uh, mm. the most insects. And uh, oaks are very, very important, especially That's when they're flowering. Don't yeah. think of oak okay. has flowers. They do. Um, they're not showy. But um, you know those birds, they, they can see these little teeny, teeny caterpillars yeah, on those flowers and on the new leaves that are coming out. Willows are also very, very good for, for insects. So and, if you go to, and if you go to um, the National Wildlife Federation's Plant Finder, there's a, it'll, and type in your zip code, it'll tell you which are the top producing, top caterpillar insect producing um, tree and herbaceous species in your area. So if you want to plant something, you can go to that website. I mean, it'll tell you, you know, oaks in your area have 300 species and willows have 200 and goldenrods have 300 or whatever. It's really, it's a really helpful site if you're looking to plant things. There you go. You can add I that into I your, look it up. Yeah. yeah, into your grid about which trees to plant. Yeah. yeah. Are there any questions that I hear, I hear somebody talking with? About uh, I have some questions. Let's toss out some questions or I comments. A, I have a question. Early on, you hey. talked about uh, warm <laughs> muscles, I think. She is just looking for some Speak, speak a little louder. I think that's Kurt. Can, if you can speak a little louder, please. Yeah. Early uh, on, you talked about warm muscles. Miss she was away. Oh. oh. What are those? I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't catch that. I, I think he was talking about the warming muscles. Oh, yeah, so warming muscles in birds, they're, they're the muscles that when we shiver, when an animal shivers to warm ourselves up, birds have these muscles that are really designed for that when they're young. It's these, um, these heat-producing muscles that just shiver um, to, make, uh, to make them warm, and the baby birds don't have that. Um, so it takes a while for that, those muscles to develop, that muscle control to develop, to be able to sort of shiver yourself warm. Shiver yourself warm. That's interesting. Oh, Green Fox is Judy Semrock. Oh, yeah. <laughs> where's, where's the question mark thing? And of course, the one topic we didn't talk about were, um, and predators are the um, cowbirds. So, cowbird uh, parasitism nests, that's, a whole, that's really a whole program in and of itself. Um, but the uh, 
it is just so everybody knows you can't remove cowbird eggs from nests. They're a native species. But for a lot of the recovery plans of birds, um, that is listed as one of the strategies because cowbirds are becoming somewhat of a subsidized predator. They do really well in sort of degraded habitat. Um, and we have a lot of degraded habitat, forest sedges and things like that. So we're not um, directly subsidizing the predator by feeding it, but we're subsidizing their parasitism by degrading habitat. Um, the kind of bird that's precocial and uh, lives in New Zealand, I'm going to look oh, the name because I totally forgot it as soon as I, it came out of my mouth. <laughs> well, the male fowl is one. It's a, it's a megapode? Yes. Yes, yeah, so there's a megapode. Male fowl? Mally, M-A-L-L-E-E-F-O-W-L. Okay, I'll have to look that up. Yeah, I think there's a couple of, of ones. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. Oh. No, please, please. I was just looking. I was just looking I bet it you up here. Do a search on now, Google, yeah. and come up with that. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think uh, that's the. You know, you're going to have Rust Belt writers talking about their uh, compost pile. Hey, maybe we can toss some whole eggs in there and then snake eggs. Throw some chicken eggs in and see what happens. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and they wow. were. They were. You know. I mean, they were like an cluster stuck together. It was like jelly beans all oh, wow. I mean big jelly beans. They were like this big. And they were stuck together? Well they were all clumped yeah, in a pile. pile. So when okay. I was digging out my compost I came across these things and I it took me by surprise. It took me a minute to realize what they were probably. And then I buried yeah. them back yeah. up. And yeah. I had some great things. Trying to think of another question. Um, oh um, you were mentioning oh, about not feeding at certain thing. times of the year. Uh, I try not to feed in the oh, summer so because that attracts cowbirds. And I get tired of cowbird babies being like fed them. by chipping sparrows and song mm -hmm. sparrows. So, so I try not to feed, except the hummingbirds and orioles. But, uh, but I try not to put seed out in the summertime. Oh, if we should stop. Yeah, that's one of the things I'm hoping that um, I'm hoping that maybe Audubon Society as a whole will start to start to address. I think we need more information on what we should be doing and when. Um, you know, really based on the, the new research that we have and the new data that we have coming out. Stop feeding in the summer. They don't need seeds. They don't need suet. They don't need suet. All righty. Well, I think, I think we are at our time's end. And uh, again, I thank everybody for joining us this evening. Oh, Carrie, thank you so much for your That's information. Oh, was there, was there another question? I'm sorry. Nope, guess not. Um, but yeah, thank you again ever, ever so much. And uh, um, I hope everybody has a great rest of the week. I think it's supposed to be pretty nice, although we are a little dry right now. I think we could use a little up. Uh, my wildflowers that I have growing in the yard. Just to get some rain on Thursday, I think. Okay. <laughs> so anyhow, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Please take yeah. a look at our website. Lots of information there. Yeah, um, so and join us for next month's program. Thanks, everyone. Bye.